Hello, my name is Sean DeClean. I'm a member of the Executive Committee of the World Economic Forum, on whose behalf I would like to welcome all of those joining today's Food Systems Outlook for 2022, where we will address both the very real potential for a food crisis over the coming months in the face of volatile global shocks emerging out of conflicts such as the war in the Ukraine and elsewhere, combined with the growing impact that more frequent extreme weather-related events are having on the entire food system. Equally important, however, the panel will also address the role that food and land use systems are themselves having in significantly contributing to climate change and biodiversity loss, which together with the substantial impact that poor or inadequate diets are having on our wider health systems, means it's become more urgent than ever for countries to address this complex set of drivers holistically and not in silos, to identify the opportunities for real and genuine change and to transition food systems to a net zero, nature positive future, one that is more resilient to shocks, but at the same time able to nourish and feed everyone in a way that is both healthier for people and the planet as a whole. This opening plenary forms part of a broader two-day Bold Actions for Food event that is currently underway with a series of workshops covering Asia, Europe, Africa and the Americas, convening leaders from government, business, civil society, international organisations and academia who are driving multi-stakeholder action on accelerating innovative, inclusive and scale examples of food systems change in their respective countries and regions. It's therefore our distinct pleasure, therefore, to introduce Bronwyn Nielsen, founder of the Nielsen Media Network, with over 20 years of broadcast leadership in Africa and globally, who will moderate what should be a dynamic plenary panel, for which translation is available in both French and Spanish. Over to you, Bronwyn. Sean, thank you very much for the introduction and another warm welcome to the opening plenary of the Bold Actions for Food Meetings. And of course, we are looking at the Food Systems Outlook for 2022. We're joined today by a distinguished panel of global leaders from public, private and social sectors working to improve global food systems, and of course, as Sean alluded to earlier, address pressing challenges facing both people and planet. Again, emphasizing the fact that we have the enormity of a dual challenge that we're tackling right now. We have a new era or new area of constant volatility and risk associated with unprecedented climate and weather events threatening harvests in key bread baskets around the world, such as Africa, a war in Europe, in the Ukraine, threatening food insecurity and food supply chains, a global pandemic, disruptions to livelihoods and supply chains as well. And of course, the other part of the challenge is that we need to address enormously stressed food systems already in desperate need to transition to net zero. Nature positive, as Sean said earlier, that nourish all and importantly, importantly, ladies and gentlemen, leave no one behind. Now, we know the alarming stat that food systems account for one third of greenhouse gas emissions. A leading contributor to climate change, and there is, of course, an enormous opportunity to make gains on climate goals. And we could unlock significant gains to realize climate commitments on both mitigation and adaptation if we do it right. Rising food and energy prices are further exacerbating a system already failing and the number is staggering, over 768 million people living in hunger worldwide with threats of famine in sub-Saharan Africa, Afghanistan, and most recently, the food insecurity effects from the war, as I said earlier, in Ukraine, among others. In today's panel, we'll try to unpack the complexity and address a few key dimensions, 
the global outlook for 2022 insofar as food systems are concerned. As I said, rising food insecurity, market volatility is something we also need to take into consideration. Enabling countries to take an integrated transition across food, nature and health and then unlocking policy, innovation and finance levers to scale solutions. I'm joined, as I said, by a distinguished panel. We have Jürgens Fogele, who is Vice President of the Sustainable Development of the World Bank. We've got Rodrigo Santos, who is member of the Board of Management and President of the Crop Science Division of Bayer. Hanneke Fauber, who's the President of Nutrition Unilever, and Sam Cass, partner, Acre Venture Partners. Thank you all for joining me and let's kick off this discussion. Jürgen, if I can come to you and perhaps get uh, your outlook given the short-term pressures we are facing as both Sean and I have highlighted in the context setting for this discussion, balancing that alongside the medium to long-term needs of resilience and adaptation of our food systems. Jürgen. Well, thanks very much, Bronwyn. Uh, you and, and great to um, have the opportunity to discuss this really, really urgent and important issue with you and uh, on the panel and, and, and all of you on, on, the, on the call. You've already framed actually the session really quite well. As you said, not only you know, are we sick of, of COVID after two years, strong focus on dealing with that emergency. We also have really stepped up on the gli climate agenda overall really strongly over the last two years. But as if that wasn't enough, now we're facing a war. And, and, and all its implications. And there are massive implications in terms of migration, in terms of economic fallout, but of course, also in terms of what does it mean in terms of food security for hundreds of millions of people. Prices are shooting up. I think we've all been following this. And you know, maybe more than ever, this just shows how, how exposed our food systems are globally. Now, Russia and Ukraine account for almost 30% of international sales of wheat. Uh, they are very large. They're actually the largest exporter. Russia is the largest exporter of wheat, not the largest producer. That's China and India, but they do not export wheat in any significant amounts. And then plus poor harvest, supply chain issues, global stocks are low, very low, uh, even though they were rebuilt after the last food price crisis, which was about 12 years ago. They are now 31% below five-year average. And, you know, also it's not just wheat, it also impacts edible oils. Ukraine is 50% of sunflower oil is exported by Ukraine. Barley, corn, uh, rapeseed, uh, also major implications on fertilizer production, fertilizer prices. So as I said, the war is just exacerbating what was already an important food crisis. Uh, COVID had already increased the number of food insecure to just about 800 million. I think uh, you mentioned this. So we were already in, in, on a bad trend, and this is just on top of We've seen the prices rise, uh, as, as you have said, and, and, and as everybody's following, it's 53% uh, wheat price increase just over the last couple of months. So clearly those countries that are major importers uh, from Ukraine and Russia will feel the impact the most. Egypt is the largest importer of wheat worldwide. It imports about 70% of its wheat from Ukraine and Russia. And that wheat accounts for 35% of daily calories per person. But it's not only uh, Ukraine, I mean, it's not only Egypt. Most people will maybe not know that Indonesia is the second largest wheat importer from Russia. So um, again, they are thinking through what the implications are. But other countries are similarly affected. It's Georgia, Lebanon, Armenia, DRC, many African countries, uh, South Sudan, up to 90% of their imports come from Russia. So there will be massive disruptions. Now, while most countries are likely to see these most immediate effects, the effects on the global food supply will be much greater and much longer lasting. This is not just a short term uh, issue. And so my first really important message to everyone on the call is how serious this will become will greatly depend on what kind of policies uh, countries are going to put in place in the next few weeks. And in particular, on the policies that restrict trade, what we cannot have is a repeat of what happened in 2008, where more than 50 countries imposed uh, export bans, export restrictions, try to control prices, keep them artificially at the low level. So distorting the flow, distorting the markets. That eventually was the reason that led to the uh, Arab Spring, as many of you will recall. So 
again, we, are, we have a confluence of factors that's not dissimilar. It's not the same that what happened 12 years ago, but it's, it's similar. Oil prices are high, stocks are low, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't want to go through the details. But it is just, for me, this is one of the most urgent and most immediate things that everyone needs to communicate around and needs to have a conversation around. Because we are seeing already a number of countries doing the kinds of things that are absolutely detrimental uh, to, to uh, lowering prices and, and helping those that are affected by it. Um, I, I will not, don't want to single out too many, but for instance, Indonesia has already uh, restricted the export of palm oil because palm oil is a substitute for uh, sunflower oil. Uh, and this could remove 100,000 tons of palm oil per month from world markets. And of course, that you know, ratchets up the prices and it also distorts internally. Uh, the situation, but it's not only Indonesia. There are a number of countries where we are seeing this right now. So, but as Thank you me. said in, in your opening framing, we, we should not just concentrate on the on the uh, immediate problems, but also address the longer term problems. The, the transformation of the food sector is really long overdue. We are, we are about 10 to 20 years behind other sectors that we need to transform to address what's a more and more urgent problem, and that's the climate issue. Yeah, you mentioned the numbers, agriculture, forestry, and land use account for between a quarter and a third of all greenhouse gas emissions, and they do drive climate change. And we are really decades behind compared to the energy sector. In the energy sector, everybody gets it, right? The future is renewable, decarbonize, get to net zero. We, we know that we need to do the same in, in the food system, but we are not spending the resources that we really need to breaking down the components of the food transformation, how, do, how we need to sequence this and how we can finance them. We do know there is a lot of win-win out there where you really contain, I mean, maintain productivity, production, but you can reduce the emissions very dramatically, certainly in rice production, also in beef production. The, the technologies are out there, but we need to well, actually- Well, Jürgen, I want, to pick up, I want to pick up on that point and, and bring Rodrigo right. in, because you are saying absolutely the technology is there, the advancement is there, but we don't want to make these short-term knee-jerk reactions, as you refer to the example of palm oil in Indonesia. And that's going to destabilize the environment over the medium and longer term. Again, not to pick out any country, as you say, there are numerous examples of this. But Rodrigo, if we are moving to having to make those decisions and looking at it from the private sector, looking at, at regenerative agriculture, can we make those decisions in the short term so that we are safeguarded in the longer term? Rodrigo. Thank you very much, Ronnie. And my short answer is yes, we can. Uh, and But before I, I share a little bit more, first, my thoughts with the Ukrainian population there. We have our colleagues working there, and we are working daily to try to supply farmers uh, seed and inputs for their season. So um, really, all our thoughts for, for, for the population that is there uh, dealing with this war that is really something that we wouldn't expect in my generation is something that is really uh, bad to see that happening today. So, but let me go to your question. We just uh, just had, we have today 5,000 farmers on a carbon program that we launched uh, less than two years ago, including 1,000 farmers in India uh, in rice or soybean and corn farmers in, in the Americas, uh, the European coalition in, in, in also in Europe, of course. And my answer is that can we, and I was talking with a farmer yesterday, and the question was, can we produce affordable health and safety food while we are sequestering carbon on the soil and help mitigate the climate change? The answer is yes, it's possible, but require a massive work from the three sectors that you mentioned, from the private sector, the public sector, was Jorgen mentioned very well, and also the, the civil society here. We need to have a conjoint collaboration here. Three words come to my mind just to conclude this first uh, speech here. So first one is innovation. I really hope that the entire society and the public se sector understand the importance of science and innovation to help us to deal with that. That's an extremely important one. The second one is collaboration. No one can achieve that isolated. We need to collaborate. We need to work together. And the third one, probably I would emphasize the most, action. We need to move to action from all the different sectors, right? So that's why I'm proud to share about the 5,000 carbon farmers that we mentioned or the smallholder initiative that we are working to reach 
100 million smallholders farmer on our plan, working with different companies to do that. Uh, but that's the three words that I'll, I'll leave here for all of us, right? We need to welcome and nurture innovation and science. We need to collaborate further among the different sectors, and we need to drive actions right now, because as Jorgen said, this is something that we need to do now, otherwise we will face much more challenges in the future on a not resilient uh, food system. Rodrigo, I want to stay with you here on that uh, word that you put into the fray, action. Why mm -hmm. is it then that we are 20 to 30 years behind when it comes to food systems and their impact on the broader climate environment? Yeah, that's an interesting one because it's a complex uh, scheme that we have here, different from the oil and gas that Jorgen just mentioned. It's easy. First of all, we need to include farmers on the equation here. Uh, when I sit on this forum, when I go globally and have those conversations, farmers, they are part of the solution. And we need to bring them to the table and help them to transform the food system, right? So how can we, the private sector, have the programs that can help them to do that, the public sector to really put the regulatory systems in place, how we frame the political environment to support the farmers to move to that new system, new regenerative system, and also the uh, civil society understanding the extremely important role that the farmers will play in the future. So my short answer for that one is that it's a complex with you're dealing with small farmers in India, as I mentioned, or a large farmer in, in Cerrados, Brazil, and bringing them to the table, helping them to transform the food system is really, really, really important. Hanukkah, from a Unilever perspective, I happened to come across your purpose, doing well by doing good. And I thought that's an excellent framing for this very discussion and what you are driving from a Unilever perspective in terms of the supply chain and perhaps picking up on what Rodrigo has laid the groundwork there from, from a private sector perspective. How can we action more quickly? I'm sure you get asked that question all the time. Yeah, and, and Rodrigo is, is spot on. We got to act. It's the time to admire the problem is over. Um, so at Unilever, we believe, you know, we have a huge responsibility to help transform the food system. And there's five actions that we're prioritizing that we think are really important in the system. And of course, we don't do this alone. Let me say that up front. We do that, you know, as part of coalitions with many partners. So the five are zero hunger, regenerative agriculture, plant-based, food waste and nutrition. So on zero hunger, you know, Jurgen said it very well, food security is so critical in the current context. And we must just work our very, very hardest to avoid this double catastrophe of war and hunger. Um, we're providing generous humanitarian aid um, and it is critical that we maintain the free flow of goods uh, and agricultural materials around the world at this time and avoid hoarding. Jurgen said it very, very well. Regenerative agriculture is also critical for our industry to get to net zero. We're a huge greenhouse gas emitter as an industry. Um, and to get to net zero, we, we got to act. So just on our Knorr brand, um, we're launching eight new large regenerative ag projects with farmers this year, uh, including in North America and Iowa and soybeans and in Arkansas and rice in Europe and in South America. Very, very important that we act. Uh, Plant-based, uh, that's about the consumer and changing his or her diet to a bit less meat and a bit more plants will make a big impact for the planet uh, and for net zero. Um, so that's all about delicious products like uh, Magnum Vegan ice cream, which is absolutely gorgeous, um, or the vegetarian butcher products. Food waste reduction is also with the consumer. Um, you guys know the world wastes a third of all the food that we produce, which is an absolute crime. Um, and we're leveraging brands especially, like Hellman's. Especially, Hanukkah. Yeah. And I just want to emphasize that point, especially with 768 million people living in hunger. We just can't yeah. rationalize those two elements. Absolutely. And that's why all these things are, are linked, because we're also using way too much land and therefore emitting too, much, too many greenhouse gases to produce all that food that we don't end up consuming. Um, so very, very important. And again, we're using our brands to make that a little funner. Maybe you saw our Hellman's campaign on the Super Bowl, Make Taste, Not Waste. Um, their education is really, really critical. 
Um, value nutrition, of course, we got to continue to make our products um, better for people with less salt, less sugar, fewer calories, uh, and more micronutrients. So that's the actions that we're taking, um, and um, hopefully that will help change the system. Well, that opens up beautifully to Sam, who led the food and nutrition policy for the Obama administration. Sam, you teed up perfectly there by a Hanukkah who refers to nutrition, refers to the consumer making better choices, i.e. plant-based decisions. Come in with your thought leadership here. Uh, well, you know, it's going to take all parts of the equation from way upstream and ag all the way down to the consumer to move this system in a direction that we need it to go. And, you know, I think as everybody's saying, we're fundamentally out of time. Like there's no more time to waste. In fact, we're way behind the eight ball. And you're seeing moments like this, like the Ukraine exacerbate, you know, what was already a pretty fragile situation. We're now like second year where wheat crop is likely going to be 15% below even the United States and other regions across the world, which makes us more vulnerable to these shocks. Um, and I think we're entering an age of volatility that is the norm. We are now seeing a pretty, like, what will be our, our normal operating situation in various capacities around the world. So, of course, you have to bring in the consumer um, if you think that food companies are going to actually make the change that we're talking about here. They can't do it in isolation with what people are demanding and what they're eating. And so I think we have to take a very holistic ap approach to this. But there's a couple big things we got to start to do, uh, it seems to me. Um, one, there has every single food company has to have a transparent accounting of their carbon footprint and start publishing uh, their plan to reduce uh, the footprint. That is a baseline that only with that baseline can consumers start making more informed choices about whose products they should be buying, uh, what agricultural companies we should be supporting, et cetera. So that's sort of like a cornerstone of the whole thing. I think when we have that, then we can start to seriously understand the role that food and ag can play at sequestering massive amounts of carbon. That, for me, is the gateway drug to transforming the system. Uh, right now, if you... Yeah, yeah, before you, we move yeah. off, I, I know we, we're going okay. to hear lots Get more from you, but I think it's such an important okay. point. I want to put it to Rodrigo, exactly that, yeah. the transparent carbon footprint and the plans in terms of mitigating against that carbon footprint. Sam, I'm coming back to you, but I want to hear okay. from a private sector. Rodrigo, followed by Hanukkah here. Rodrigo, from a Bayer perspective? Yeah, so let, let me give a very concrete example. I was visiting a, a farm in the Cerrados region of Brazil that moved to a regenerative farming, right? So suddenly he was doing soybean, corn, but no tillage, crop, cover crop, crop rotation, with that system, it was an amazing result. After two years, he was producing more. At the same time, he was sequestering two tons per hectare of carbon on that soil with a partnership with Embrapa in Brazil that is the, uh, a public sector, uh, public institute there. So that's a great example. So the challenge is that how can we have not 5,000 farmers like that, but hundreds and hundreds of thousands doing that practices? And that requires innovation, collaboration, also incentive from the government to help them achieve that. That's the, that equation, if you think about that farmer and the soil of that farmer, the quality and the, the life of that soil, it's amazing. Rodrigo, also from a big company perspective, though, I mean, mm -hmm. that transparency of your own carbon footprint, how much attention is paid to that uh, line item from a Bayer perspective? Well, we made a we made a commitment for uh, carbon neutral. Our emission is four million tons per, per year. It's not that much, and we are we are already working to be a carbon neutral very short. For me, that one is a, a, a important equation. To be honest, easy to address. My key challenge is how you transform the entire sector, the entire ag sector, and that is a large scale that we were talking here. So the company itself, we made our commitments and we are moving a lot with renewable energy and other things that we are doing internally as a company. But my key challenge that I have here today is how we transform, how we help, of course, to transform the entire sector and millions of farmers globally.
Uh, absolutely, and, and that very important point, millions of farmers globally that are subsistence farming rather mm -hmm. than farming commercially, so really farming for their own survival. Hanukkah, yeah. from a... Union yeah, no, I, I'm so glad to hear Sam say this. Um, so I couldn't agree more. Um, companies need to have commitments to, on how they're going to get to net zero. Um, at Unilever, we've made a commitment to get to net zero by 2039 across our value chain. Net zero in our own operations is very simple. We're pretty much there in our factories and our offices. It's across the value chain that's very hard, and which is why regenerative agriculture is so critical. Um, but I would say to Sam's point also, um, we need brands. So, you know, we only sells many, many different brands. We need brands and individual products to be transparent on their carbon footprint. So that's something that we're also working very hard on to get consumers to be able to see, wow, you know, this bag of tea is actually a lot more carbon positive than that one. Um, so Sam, couldn't agree with you more and um, would love to connect to, for any more thoughts you might have on that. Great. Sam, I'm coming back to you. I just had to use that opportunity to yeah. bring private sector voice in and just double check everyone's behaving yeah. themselves. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I think here's, I mean, here's the, you could see how it starts to play out, right? From upstream where Bayer is, is operating down into how then Unilever can push those, you know, new uh, ingredients that are being produced in a different way to the consumer and start actually giving real choice to consumers that actually unlock demand. Because particularly for younger generations, we know this is what they're calling for. What's the powerful, what, what starts to come together when we, when we do this? And by the way, it's very important to say, it's not just scope one and scope two, this has to be assessment for scope three emissions as well. In the food system, for most of the most companies, 80 to 90% of their footprint is in scope three, not in scope one or two. So that's absolutely critical. But w fundamentally, what we can start to do is to reshape the economy, the food economy's relationship to natural ecosystems. Right now, it's a very extractive one, meaning we only pay for something that's taken. We take the wood out, we take the crop out, but really these systems are providing us oxygen, it's sequestering carbon, holding biodiversity, you know, keeping water, the water tables healthy and stable. These are all these systems that right now farmers, particularly and land, land use uh, management people across the board, aren't being paid for. And so that's why the, the forest in, in Brazil keeps getting cut down because they're getting paid to plant soy, even though the forest really is much more valuable to humanity as a forest. And so that's what we can start to do. That's why I think the opportunity in carbon is so powerful. Now, I, I would like to stop for a moment and say, there's still problems and things, and we're, you know, Acre, we're investing heavily in, in this space uh, from a venture standpoint, because there's still problems around measurement. We have to get much better at it. There's still problems with double counting. We have to have a system, a global system to deal with double counting. There's still technologies that can be brought to bear. Loan bio is one that we put investing very excited about to significantly increase a farmer's capacity through microbes in the soil to sequester carbon and make it more permanent in the soil. So there's lots of work to be done. So it's imperfect. <laughs> and so environmentalists who still have some doubts uh, uh, and, and, and questions, I think are very are fair game. But we have an opportunity to actually pay farmers for the first time to do the right thing. Right now we've been begging them, please, we, can you change your practices? It doesn't, hasn't made economic sense for them. Now we can pay them to do the right thing. And if we then pull that through the supply chain, where we start to incentivize both brands and producers to start sequestering carbon and start valuing the ecosystem that they should be protecting. I think we have, honestly, the only chance that I've ever seen, really, to systemically transform the global agricultural system and start solving some of the biggest problems that we face. And I hope in the moment of crisis like we're in right now that we don't take our eye off that broader work because we just simply can't afford to. Um, but that's what's really possible, and I think, you know, the pieces are just starting to come together, but we have to dramatically invest more. We have to get out of our comfort zone. We have to set much more aggressive targets. We're out of time. It's the time has to be now. So I've got eight more minutes for the panel. And of course, we also want to talk about COP27. We want to talk about the, the global milestones that we've made in the space when it comes to, to food systems. So I'm going to bring back Jürgen and let's do another round on the panel here in terms of, of Jürgen as we build to, to COP27. 
How can we ensure that we are actually adding to those milestones that have already been achieved and that we're not just at the table having the same conversations over and over again, i.e., when it came back to what Rigo was saying, he said that that third element is action. I think everybody is there. Jürgen, to you. Well, thanks, Bronwyn. You must allow me a couple of comments on what I've just heard, which was brilliant from Sam and, 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 our, and our colleagues from the private sector, because a number of keywords were brought up, but really not uh, you know, taken to the point where I think they need to be. One was, how do you support farmers to do the food production the right way? That is the key. Right now, they're not supported to do that. The government support farmers to the tune of three quarters of a trillion dollars a year. That's called agricultural subsidies. And very little of that is actually targeted towards getting the outcomes that we've just discussed. It is very easy to shift those, to repurpose those subsidies, to incentivize farmers rather than throwing more fertilizer into the field where it's already too much or doing the wrong techniques to say, you get your subsidy, but you must do this. And, and this will then lead to better nutritional outcomes, will lead to better climate outcomes. The techniques are known. There are good examples. We don't have time in this panel to discuss them, but we need to massively scale this up, which is one topic we need to discuss at COP27. Practically, what is it that can be done and incentivized? Because we're talking a huge amount of public money, which right now is not only wasted, it is actually detrimental. And that must change. This has to be a key conversation going into COP27. Just two examples. One is the beef cattle. It's not only, you know, yes, cattle are a huge part of the problem, but if they're produced right, you can actually have a zero uh, emission uh, system. That's possible. We know it from Latin America. There, there are ways of doing this. The same with rice. You can produce the same amount of rice, but if you do it differently, you don't want to go into the technical details, you can you can cut the emissions in half and the farmer has no, no loss. It just needs to be done and managed well. So I think these are hugely important points. And I wanted to make one other point because I wrecked my head over this question, why are we 20 years behind now for a long, long, long time? And one thing I've come up with together with, 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 with our team is we don't have a North Star yet, so to speak. You know, in energy, people understand. They see a smokestack and they know that's bad and they know the North Star is to get rid of carbon and fossil fuels and then we will be fine, regardless whether it's, so, whether it's you know, solar panel or windmill or whatever other technology will come out. It's clear what it is that needs to go away and what needs to be done. It's not clear in agriculture. It is not clear to most people what is really wrong other than the food waste, because when you look at a field, it's green, it's beautiful, it produces, and people don't see it. They don't feel it, that something is wrong with it so fundamental. I think those are two topics I want to certainly take to COP27. In terms of practical action, the policy action to me is critical, and what I said earlier in, in, in the export, but that's short term. The subsidy issue is absolutely crucial and essential. And then pushing the technologies that are already out there. Companies are out there that have fantastic technology, which is not being used because the farmer has no incentive to do it, because the consumer doesn't pay more for a liter of milk if the cow that it's produced from has, has a lower genetic, a better genetic uh, you know, composition than, than the one that doesn't, or, or doesn't use a, a supplement that reduces methane emissions by another 30%. All this is out there, but it's not being used. And then, of course, there is what Rigo was saying, there's still a bunch of stuff that we still need to invent. So innovation is absolutely critical. We need to continue to invest in innovation for a purpose, not just innovation, but for the purpose of getting, making the food system transform and making it better. And there it goes, innovation for a purpose. Hanika, what will you be driving at COP27 from a Unilever perspective, again, to build on milestones that have already been achieved and try somehow to close that gap that we are 20 to 30 year behind the curve when it comes to transforming food systems. Yeah, yeah. So I think first of all, we ought to make sure food's on the agenda for these meetings. So um, at COP26 in Scotland, it wasn't actually even on the agenda, um, which is horrific because we're such a huge emitting industry. Um, it, that has to change. So um, let's make sure it's on the agenda and then show up obviously, as individual companies, as NGOs, as governments, and talk about the real issues. I couldn't agree more with Jürgen. Um, you know, repurposing agricultural subsidies is critically important to get to regenerative agricultural practices to incentivize farmers to do the right thing. They're, they're business people. They're not going to do it if it doesn't make money for them and if they get incentivized for actually doing the wrong thing. Um, I, wouldn't, I don't agree with Jürgen that that's easy to do. I think uh, the EU has been trying unsuccessfully. Um, the other 
big geographies I haven't even tried yet. So, but I do agree it's a giant issue that needs to be resolved. Sorry, on this one, you know, it's totally impossible to ask for reducing subsidies. No go. Mm -hmm. Politically impossible. Yeah. It is possible to have a conversation of saying, keep the same amount for political reasons, mm -hmm. but give it to the same farmer for political reasons, but give it for a different incentive. Yeah. And Europe yeah. is not where it needs to be, but it has improved in the last 30 years quite a bit. Yeah. The, the actual emissions from agriculture, the, the, the subsidy amount hasn't changed much in the last 30 years, about 60 billion euros mm. per year. But the, the emissions have been reduced quite significantly because a third of that money is actually given to do things the right way. And I've, mm. I've, we've had success in other countries, notably China and others, having that same argument to change the way this is structured. Brazil, is, by the way, also has, does, has, does a lot of good things in, the, in this direction. Yeah. I yeah, you want to make a final point there before I bring No, Sam no, I, I think it, it is all about repurposing the money that's flowing around. Um, I would have loved to see the EU do more um, so, uh, you know, and go faster. So I think your help there, Jurgen, will be really helpful. <laughs> Sam, if you can weigh in before I introduce uh, Don um, from Q, if you can come in here, just give me a sense of COP27 consumers' incentives in terms of farmers. Where do you want to leave it? Uh, you know, you can't you can't leave any of them out. None of this works unless all those systems come together. I mean, that's just, and we have to start understanding this in a holistic way. You're gonna. I will just say on on the policies after you know six years in the White House. I, I will say things are, are night and day since when I was there. Not that many years ago, uh, the current administration in the United States, for example, Secretary Vilsack is driving you know pretty rapid change uh, across the agency. There's a billion dollar carbon program being stood up right now, and hopefully that. A lot of those incentives start to flow through the through the farm bill and other policy changes, which I know the government's working on. And, you know, when we were there, climate change, you said call the word climate change in agriculture. It was like there, there was like stop. There was no conversation to be had. Now you see environmental groups and some of the most conservative producer organizations working together to try to figure out how to bring uh, the parties together to do something big. And I think that those kind of coalitions have to be built. They're missing the consumer right now. They have to get in that conversation in terms of the, you know, those uh, those companies that are representing. How do we then drive that through the consumer lens and make consumers start demanding and paying companies to do the right thing? And that has to go to COP. I agree. I've been screaming about, yeah, you know, COP twenty one, nothing. The last COP, nothing. It's unbelievable considering that not only is it just such a big emitter, but I, I firmly believe that food and agriculture is the only sector that in the next 10 years has the chance to mitigate the worst of climate change and buy us enough time for these other technologies that people are working on to actually get scale and become cost affordable. We don't, we're not look. other industries can reduce. Food and ag is the only one that is ready right now to actually take carbon out of the air and sequester it. Nothing else can do that. And so we don't galvanize this and put it at the top of the agenda in the next COP and the next COP and the next COP. We're simply not going to come close to mitigating the worst of this. So it's, it's really nice. It's like we have to go flip this thing on its head, get much more aggressive, much more bold in asserting our role in this and start going to work to prove to the world that, hey, if we do this right and we have the right incentives and the right investment, we actually can lead the way in, in solving the problem, particularly over the short and middle term. And then after that, we're going to need more technologies to take us to, you know, to, the, to the finish line. If we do this right, we have the right incentives, the right policies, we can actually make a huge difference when it comes to the security of food systems and further their ability to be sustainable and to provide nutrition. So thank you very much to Sam, to Hanika, and to Jürgen and Rodrigo for joining us for this robust debate. I'm now very, very pleased to ask Chu Don Yu, Director General, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, to join us with his reflections from the panel and how, of course, FAO is addressing these issues. Uh, so over to you. Thank you, Brian, Wendy. And I'm uh, listening to what are your discussion. I'm so interested in learning from you, Yogi, our uh, friend, and also others. Uh, you are really addressing issues. Eh? I think uh, for climate smart and culture or climate resilient and culture, whatever you call it, but we, we, see, we do need to do more fit the purpose. Not only for innovation fit the purpose, and also policy. 
And look, the yoga, you mentioned it very rightly about the, the energy. Energy is the build the, the, from the grass, from the one factory, <laughs> uh, one small subsector up to the top leaders, so build the enabling policy to transform that sector so in a renewable and so on. So, and also byproducts of byproducts. Not only, you know, uh, general things, uh, uh, from a concept to concept. That's what we have to learn from uh, uh, energy transformation. Agro-food system transformation is more complicated, of course, because we are working with uh, different animals, different plants, and also agriculture is more specific to the different environment. And even one side of the mountain, another side of mountain is different. That makes it uh, more complicated, but there are a lot of politicians didn't understand what the, the uh, complex of agro-food systems. That's why you should have to be more clear, more accessible to the politician to get a more strong commitment. Second, I think also science and the scientists should be have more specific design, the uh, 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 pragmatic approach to address the issues. For rice, for cattle, you mentioned cattle. I think I, I closely work in one commodity by commodity. And that's, they are still have a, a chance to be built up on the uh, a neutral, uh, carbon neutral or zero emission. First, tea and the coffee. If we already uh, established some kind of a best practice for that. And I think also we work with uh, uh, others on the uh, cattle or milk. I think also it's possible because uh, if we reduce the energy consuming, not only for the water consuming and also for the other energy consuming, uh, uh, feed and so on, and then we were minimizing that kind of uh, 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 emission or energy con consumption. And last but not least, we have to look at the whole charm value, get the balance uh, and zero emission. Not only product side, from production to the process to the supply chain, and then for the loss on the West, I think Honorable Minister Vyasaki is here. So uh, when I was in China, also we <laughs> we always put the a uh, lot of efforts on how to to reduce the food loss in the West. I think so far globally is got a consensus on how to address the issues related to the food loss in the West. I hope and also who is the buyer pay for the price of the. Uh, agro-food system transformation, get the consumers, get the family, farmer, and all these key players to work together. Not only farmers to, to uh, take their responsibility, also the consumers should be. That's my idea. So uh, let's start to say, I, I also support the call the, uh, recently the uh, Ukraine uh, crisis. We should also first, uh, we should ask, uh, support the, the UN Secretary General to end the war, restore peace, and protect pe people's life in Ukraine crisis. Without this ceasefire or peace, how can we move on the uh, food system production supply from that region? It's that's our preconditions: peace and stability. Third, I think also we have to work together from the public and the private and the civil society together for agro-food system transformation. Thank you so much, uh, sir. I can do that. Yes, thank you. Oh, to Dong Yu, who's Director General of Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Thank you for your reflections there, sir. It's now my honor to invite the Honorable Tom J. Volsack, who is the Secretary of Agriculture of the United States, for his closing remarks on the food system's outlook and the way forward. Thank you so much, sir. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you. Uh, and I've been listening to a very robust conversation and discussion about a very incredibly important topic. Couldn't agree more with the folks who have suggested that COP, future COP meetings have got to focus on food and agriculture as a critical component uh, to reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions and getting our arms around the climate challenge that we face. In the U.S., we have very aggressive goals. Uh, we want to get to net zero U.S. agriculture by 2050. We want to meet our NDA target by 2030, which requires a, a significant effort. Uh, I'm going to just touch on a, a couple of things we're doing in the U.S. and also talk a little bit about the international situation. Um, 
Sam Cass mentioned uh, our, our effort, our billion dollar effort, uh, which we refer to as the partnership for climate smart commodities. You mentioned getting consumers engaged in this. Well, one way to get them engaged is by making sure they know when they go in a grocery store whether or not the products they are buying are in fact made from climate smart commodities. That is to say, uh, commodities that were produced through climate smart agricultural practices and regenerative practices. Uh, we've established a billion dollar effort uh, to begin the process of putting together large scale pilots and demonstration projects uh, for the purpose of a rapid adoption uh, by our farmers, ranchers and producers of those climate smart practices and regenerative practices the development and use of accurate and verifiable measurement tools that will allow us to track greenhouse gas reductions and or carbon sequestration, uh, allow us to create verifiable results that will establish a standard by which we can then establish and uh, market climate smart commodities. And working with those consumer, uh, those producer groups, uh, working with food processing companies to create a market opportunity we see this as a value-added opportunity for producers. We see it as an opportunity for producers as well to qualify for ecosystem markets, which will create another revenue stream. And we believe that the combination of resources from the government, uh, additional market opportunities, and uh, ecosystem markets will create the kind of incentive for rapid adoption by uh, producers across the United States. We also believe that as we create these climate-smart commodities, we also have to uh, essentially complement our production agriculture system with a more robust commitment to local and regional food systems uh, to be able to reduce the, uh, the mileage, if you will, that food travels uh, from farm to fork. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we put together a billion dollar commitment to expand processing capacity in the United States. We want to create more competition for farmers, but we also want to make sure that we are uh, investing in a robust uh, local and regional food system. We learned during the pandemic uh, that the current system, while it is incredibly efficient, it was not resilient. Uh, and resiliency does involve uh, providing resources uh, to, uh, to create the, the kind of technical assistance that will allow uh, small and mid-sized producers to understand where the market opportunities are. Uh, developing uh, food hubs, uh, uh, an opportunity for smaller sized operations to basically aggregate uh, their production uh, to be able to market it more effectively uh, to uh, restaurants, to grocery stores, to schools, to institutional purchasers. Uh, we're looking at ways in which we can use the procurement dollars of the federal government uh, to encourage this as well. Just recently announcing uh, over $600 million of, of procurement opportunities uh, through our uh, temporary uh, food assistance program for food banks and for schools to be able to purchase from local and regional distribution systems to create the muscle mass and memory if you will, uh, of how you can create and, and structure a more uh, uh, solid and robust uh, local and regional food system. Renewable energy and fuel development also incredibly important, uh, especially since we are now challenging ourselves to create a low carbon aviation fuel. Uh, the reality is it's gonna be a while before we have hydrogen uh, fueled airplanes uh, that can travel long distances. So in the meantime, uh, why not figure out a way in which we can significantly reduce uh, the uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from our transportation system by developing an aviation uh, fuel, a 35 billion gallon opportunity. Uh, we have an aviation grand challenge where the Department of Energy, Department of uh, Agriculture, and the Department of Transportation are joining forces uh, to create this, uh, this new industry, this new opportunity. Uh, we're excited about this. We're excited about our farm uh, to... Uh, to, to school, farm to restaurant, farm to institutional purchaser network that we're creating uh, as part of our, our effort. Uh, let me speak briefly about uh, the commitment that we're making in terms of innovation. It was mentioned uh, during the course of your conversation of the important role that innovation is playing and needs to play. Uh, we joined forces with the United Arab Emirates, the United States, in asking the world to join us in partnership uh, to promote uh, and to expand a rapid adoption of, of innovation uh, in this space. Uh, we started off with a handful of countries uh, and a few NGOs. We now have over 100 partners who are part of the Aim for Climate initiative that was launched uh, uh, by President Biden uh, during a summit meeting early uh, in 2021, mentioned during the COP26 meeting, and it's going to be a focal point of the next two COP, uh, uh, COP meetings. Uh, we now have over 100 partners. We have uh, Sprint partners. We have now nine Sprint uh, operations where several hundred million dollars is being committed by private sector uh, folks to look at ways in which they can expand uh, a significant adoption 
of climate smart practices. Uh, IBM just recently announced a, uh, a partnership, a sprint partnership, uh, roughly $10 million, uh, where they're going to provide technical assistance and some of their, uh, some of their data processing uh, to be able to enable farmers to do a better job of understanding in places like India uh, and elsewhere. Uh, how they could use climate smart practices uh, to be more productive and also to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, a, an opportunity as well uh, for us to continue to look for ways in which we can encourage investment in this space. We started with a $4 billion a goal. Uh, we reached that goal very quickly uh, in terms of commitments. Uh, we're now looking at trying to get by COP27 an $8 billion uh, commitment over the next several years. Uh, the UAE is very interested in this because they import 80% of their food. Uh, they want to make sure that that 80% is still available, uh, notwithstanding the, uh, the changing climate. They also want to be more self-sufficient, uh, looking at creative and innovative ways uh, to expand significantly agricultural production. And we at USDA are also engaged in this uh, by investing in everything from uh, research to uh, vertical, uh, vertical farming. Uh, we're going to see, I think, a very extensive effort in urban farming and expanded opportunities there as well. So there's an awful lot going on in this space. Um, and I think we, I think there is a, uh, a tipping point that we're reaching in terms of the recognition and acknowledgement of the need for agriculture to be a leading indicator in this effort to, uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I agree with Sam Cass that I think agriculture does have the opportunity to make significant strides uh, very early in this process, maybe get there before construction, maybe get there before transportation, maybe get there before utility industries uh, are able to get to their net zero future. Uh, so we're excited. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're really looking forward to uh, awarding that billion dollars uh, in the, the spring uh, to see what kind of large scale projects and even small uh, demonstration projects will be funded. Uh, we anticipate and expect that there's gonna be a, a quite a bit of competition for these resources. And we think it will spill over into the uh, Farm Bill debate of 2023 as we, as we look to recraft uh, agricultural policy in the U.S. Thank you so much to the Honorable Tom J. Vilsack. He is a Secretary of Agriculture of the United States. Uh, very appropriate closing remarks and keeping up there, right. sir, the energy of the panel. Certainly, it's all about action, action as we race towards COP27, building on the milestones that have already been achieved in 2022. Again, I'd just like to thank uh, Chu Dong Yu, Director General, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and of course, Hanika Faber from Unilever, Sam Cass, Acre Venture Partners, Rodrigo Santos from Bayer, Jürgen Vergole, who is the Vice President, Vergole, my apologies, the Vice President for Sustainable Development at the World Bank. Thank you all for the robust discussion. Of course, you can expect two more days of passionate engagement, working to action, to remedy the situation, ensuring that short-term decisions, emergency decisions, don't derail medium and long-term impact of the food systems globally. Thank you so much for joining us here again. I'd love to thank our audience for tuning in on the World Economic Forum broadcast platform, as well as the social media platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. And as I said, hoping to continue this robust debate over the next two days at Bold Actions for Food. Thank you very much for joining us.